Hello everyone and welcome to the first in a series of IWMF's 2020 Global Educational Webinars. I'm Newton Guerin, IWMF President and CEO. You know, today's webinar truly is a global event. We're expecting over 700 participants from 30 countries, you know, throughout the world. And I would like to thank our sponsors for making this program possible. Beijing, Janssen Oncology, Pharmacyclics, the Treadway Foundation, and X4 Pharmaceuticals. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Mattis. Dr. Mattis is the Medical Director at the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute and Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of Colorado. He will present Getting to Know WM Basics and Beyond. At the conclusion of his lecture, we'll have a live moderated question and answer session. So thank you all for being with us. And now it's over to you, Dr. Mattis. Hello and welcome to the 2020 IWMF Global Educational Webinar. My name is Jeff Mattis. I'm a hematologist in Denver. I work at the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute. I'm passionate about WM and passionate about everything that IWMF can do for you. And I've been tasked today with talking about getting to know WM, the basics and beyond. My goal today is to cover the basics of WM. And what I want to do is define what Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia is. I want to review the incidence, possible risk factors, and clinical presentation of WM. I'm going to go into some detail about the, how we diagnose it, what the symptoms are, and, and a little bit about treatment guidelines. I'm going to delve quite a bit into genetics. It's important these days that we all are familiar with the genetics of WM. And with respect to treatment, I'm not going to go in, into a lot of detail uh, for treatment because there are other speakers who will address that topic in more detail but we'll talk about sort of the, the way doctors think about treating patients. And lastly, I'm going to touch on some issues that are germane to WM patients with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia? Well, it's a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's a blood cancer. And these lymphomas occur when blood cells called lymphocytes and also plasma cells decide that they're not going to follow the rules that normally govern how cells divide and grow. And what they do is they reproduce out of control and furthermore, they don't die when they're supposed to. So you can see that if you have cells that are growing quickly and then not dying when they're supposed to, that over time, these cells will accumulate inside the patient. That's indeed what happens in Waldenstrom's. The other key thing about Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, or WM, is that it, the cells produce a very specific type of antibody protein called IgM. It's always IgM. And we're gonna talk a fair amount about what that IgM means and what it does to patients. And importantly, this disease was named after a very famous doctor named Jan Waldenstrom, who's a Swedish oncologist, and he first identified this back in 1944. If you're participating in this webinar and have WM, you have a rare cancer. It's a three in a million cancer. In the United States of America, we diagnose about 1,500 cases annually. The median age of diagnosis is 64. Most patients are male, and it's more common in Caucasians than other ethnic groups. And very interestingly, in about 20% of cases, you can find first degree relatives of WM patients who have other types of blood cancers, often WM. So what causes WM? I get asked this uh, question all the time by patients. So what I tell them is that it's bad luck for the most part, meaning that you, you just get it. Most cases are sporadic, meaning they just occur without a genetic predisposition. What we know is that Vietnam veterans who had Agent Orange exposure have an increased risk of WM. The main risk factor for developing WM is having an antecedent or pre-existing IgM MGUS, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And these days, we've heard a lot about Roundup or glyphosate, and, uh, and what we know is that for scientists, it's debated whether or not there's a connection between the type of lymphoma that's uh, present in WM called LPL and Roundup, but to plaintiff's attorneys, it's not often so uh, debatable anyway. So there's a specific way in which we diagnose WM, and the WHO is the World Health Organization, and they have, they have certain agreed upon criteria. And in order to make a proper diagnosis of WM, two elements are required. And one is that you have to have a bone marrow biopsy, which demonstrates a very specific kind of non-Hodgkin lymphoma called lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. And we all get quite tired about saying lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma all the time, so we call it LPL. And in addition to having LPL on a bone marrow biopsy, one must have the presence of this IgM protein in the blood. 
So if you have those two elements, the next thing we do is we categorize WM patients into different groups. And, and basically the, the main distinction here is whether or not a patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. And we'll define those later, but basically asymptomatic patients are often called smoldering patients or smoldering WM. And the symptomatic patients, of course, have some problem related to the underlying WM. In addition, there's a precursor condition called MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance with the IgM protein. And this is a precursor state that can turn into WM, but frequently is associated with a very troubling peripheral neuropathy. So this is a slide is showing what these cells look like on a bone marrow aspiration. And in a patient with WM, when you have the needle put into your pelvic bone and we withdraw the bone marrow aspirate, you can see both these lymphocytes, and I've designated those with a red arrow on this slide, and plasma cells uh, with a black arrow on this slide. And these cells are all related, and you'll find them present in the bone marrow biopsy of each and every patient who carries the diagnosis of WM. Now this is a slide uh, put together by Steve Trion and colleagues where he looked at 257 patients with WM uh, where he found first degree relatives who had other types of blood cancers. And in the light blue there you can see the great majority of these patients had uh, WM as the associated blood cancer to the person who was known to have WM. However, you can see other blood cancers as well. You can see chronic leukemia, uh, multiple myeloma, other types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and so forth. So this just points out that the, the family history is a very critical element when one is characterizing WM in a certain patient. Now, every year at the educational forum, uh, questions come up about familial Waldenstrom's. And, and there are doctors who are extremely interested in studying familial Waldenstrom's. It is what makes one family or group of individuals may be more prone to develop WM than others. And the leaders in the field are Mary McMaster, who's at the National Cancer Institute, and also Dr. Irene Gobriel, who's in Boston at the Dana-Farber. They're keenly interested in studying how this occurs. And I've listed some websites here with some links to some studies that they're doing. Now, what I hear a lot from patients, if they'll say, well, wait a minute, if this can run in families and I have WM, uh, do I need to have my family members tested to see if they have WM? And in our country, the godfather of Waldenstrom's is Dr. Robert Kyle. And Dr. Kyle has said at, this, at these forums in, in years uh, previous that it's important to recognize that there's a concept of what's called relative risk versus absolute risk. For example, if you have a three in a million lymphoma and you have a three times higher chance of getting that lymphoma, then your chance of getting it is nine in a million, so still not very common. Uh, and so it's important to keep that in mind. So I don't, I don't test family members routinely. So how do these lymphoma cells, these LPL cells misbehave? Well, they can cause symptoms in patients that, that make you feel sick and how they can do that is these plasma cells and these lymphoma cells can make this abnormal IgM protein and the IgM protein itself can cause symptoms. Also, the LPL cells themselves, the lymphoma cells, as they grow and take over the bone marrow and sometimes the lymph node tissue or the spleen, they can also cause symptoms. Additionally, and, and uh, thank goodness this is not very common, sometimes this slow-growing lymphoma called LPL can morph or transform into a more aggressive kind of lymphoma. We call that transformation, and when that occurs, it's serious and potentially life-threatening. So this is a schema here looking at how these LPL cells and or the IgM protein can cause symptoms. And on the left hand side of the slide you can see these lymphoma cells can sometimes congregate and form tumors that can uh, be present in lymph nodes. So one may get enlargement of the lymph nodes or for example the spleens. That occurs in the minority of patients but it does occur. Uh, additionally these lymphoma cells can make substances that make us have fatigue or sometimes night sweats. Some of you will have had uh, drenching night sweats is a very prominent symptom when you first were diagnosed with your WM and it's the lymphoma cells that make substances that cause that symptom. Over on the right hand side of this slide you can see that the IgM can perpetrate problems such as hyperviscosity and we'll talk about that later where the blood gets really thick and patients can have so problems such as nosebleeds, headaches, or visual disturbances. In addition, the IgM protein sometimes can cause peripheral neuropathy or some very unusual symptoms called cold agglutinin disease or cryoglobulinemia, which we'll touch on later as well. I try to talk to my patients about 
blood cancers, including WM, being like weeds that have overrun our bone marrow. And on the left here, you see uh, a garden that's completely overrun with weeds. These weeds all represent LPL cells. They're all related to each other. They're clones. When these weeds grow and take over enough of the garden, then the healthy plants in the garden can't do their thing. And when they can't do their thing, we, then we develop symptoms and signs such as anemia or fatigue. Additionally, and hopefully this is what happens when we treat people, if we treat you and we can weed the garden, then we have the picture on the right that looks, looks like remission with very healthy flowers growing and the normal production of red cells and white cells and platelets and no more of that stuff associated with the IgM proteins. So let's talk about IgM. What is this IgM all about? Immunoglobulin proteins are part of our immune defense. These are antibodies and we all have these. In, in the normal situation, we have these antibodies that are made up of heavy chains and light chains and the heavy chain joins the light chain and they become part of our infection fighting armamentarium. Now, what you'll notice here, there are five major ones, IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgD, but there's also this guy like IgM and IgM looks different from the others and indeed it is. So IgM is a much larger protein than the others. And the reason this becomes an issue is that it's so, it's so much larger that if you get enough of it in your blood, it can make your blood very thick or viscous. And that's one of the reasons it can do that. So normally we have a nice mix of all different kinds of antibody or immunoglobulin proteins. And the term for this is polyclonal. Poly means many. But in WM, most of the IgM is completely identical. It comes from clones of these B cells or lymphoma cells. So we call that monoclonal. And we can find these monoclonal proteins on a blood test called an SPEP, which stands for serum protein electrophoresis. It's often ordered by a doctor who notices that the protein levels in the blood found on a routine chemistry test are too high. And this IgM can be determined by two different blood tests, an IgM level or something called an M spike, M meaning monoclonal. So this is an example of a normal SPEP or serum protein electrophoresis and take my word for it here, but there's on the right hand side of this slide, there's the Greek uh, letter gamma. And this is where the antibody proteins, most of them hang out. And so in a normal situation, this is what it looks like. It looks like a nice broad hump. But in somebody who has WM, you can see in the same gamma region, they have a spike and this is called the M spike right here. And this is what we see on uh, serum protein electrophoresis. And the level of the M spike can vary tremendously between patients, depending on what the level of the IgM is. So one way we can measure the IgM is through a test called quantitative immunoglobulins. This is an important test where we can measure the absolute levels, not just of IgM, but also the normal antibodies such as IgG or IgA. And in WM, the IgA, IgM is high and usually at the expense of the other immunoglobulins. So you see the IgM being elevated and the IgG and IgA are low and these lower levels of IgA and IgG can predispose patients to infections. Another critical point about WM is that it occurs in phases. We know this. And so it starts off as a precursor phase called MGUS, and then it goes through a smoldering stage. And then in many patients, it goes from the smoldering stage to the symptomatic stage, but not all. And so, and there are very strict definitions for each of these that have been agreed upon in the WM community. And so that's just for MGUS, smoldering, and symptomatic disease. And the critical th thing to remember here is that we only treat symptomatic Waldenstrom's. We do not treat IgM MGUS unless it's associated with neuropathy. And then we don't treat smoldering WM either. So this is a slide borrowed from Dr. Kyle again, where he goes through the diagnostic criteria for what's called IgM MGUS. And the critical point here is that IgM MGUS is associated with a very low level of IgM in the blood. And when the bone marrow biopsy is done, fewer than 10% of the cells are those LPL cells. And importantly, patients cannot have any symptoms or problems related to the IgM or the lymphoma cells. And that's, that's called IgM MGUS. And the chance of developing Waldenstrom's that requires treatment is about 2% a year for the first 10 years and about 1% per year thereafter. And I'm gonna sort of deviate here for a second because it, it, doctors always love to show these slides when, when we do these talks. And sometimes they're very confusing for patients. These are called Kaplan-Meier curves. And, and it's hard to go to any kind of talk in any kind of medical situation and not have a doctor show you a Kaplan-Meier curve. What are these? These are estimates of developing a, or having a problem or developing a problem over time. So if you follow me here on the horizontal axis, this is the time in years of a group of patients with a specific problem. And the vertical axis is the probability of, we'll say, surviving or staying in remission. It can be any of those things. 
and at time zero everyone's alive or in remission and then with over time you see certain patients may not may die or or fall out of remission and you'll see that curve fall down and so you'll see here for example in this in this example which is not Waldenstrom's by the way at two years 83 percent of patients are still alive at five years it's about 70 percent and about 50% of the patients are still alive at 11 years. So you'll see doctors report, hey, the median survival for such and such problem is 11 years. So it's important to, rem to remember though, when you see these curves, they don't apply to you. They apply to populations of people, not to individuals. And it's just a way of giving us some estimates of the probability, for example, of staying in remission or surviving. And in the, the example of IgM MGUS, looking at this curve here, if you have 100 people who are diagnosed with IgM MGUS at time zero, after 30 years, about 15% oh, of them will develop um, a, a blood cancer problem from that. So the great minority of patients over time will develop a problem. And this is a way of looking at, well, if these people with IgM MGUS, if they die, what do they die from? And the answer is they die from problems that, that are unrelated to WM, that is they, they die without having progressed to symptomatic WM or another blood cancer. The risk of, of developing WM if you have IgM MGUS is on the lower side, but patients still need to be monitored very, very carefully. So some of you have IgM neuropathy, and usually the IgM neuropathy patients have very low levels of IgM, very low amounts of LPL in the bone, LPL in the bone marrow, and, and it's a troublesome diagnosis for sure. There are different kinds of IgM neuropathy. You can have it with or without what are, what's called myelin-associated glycoproteins. There's also something called DADS, distal acquired demyelinating syndrome. And you can also see neuropathies associated with a protein called GM1. These diagnoses overlap a lot symptomatically, so they're extremely difficult to tell apart, even by experienced neurologists sometimes. Furthermore, the clinical course is quite variable. The neuropathy can be debilitating over years and the treatment is only variably effective and there's not unanimity in our community about how to treat these diseases. So what's smoldering disease? So smoldering disease is when you have a little bit higher level of IgM protein in your blood. You have more than 10% LPL cells in your bone marrow, but you do not have any problems associated with the LPL cells or the IgM. That is, you're completely asymptomatic. You don't have anemia, you don't have night sweats. These patients have a higher chance of turning into symptomatic WM, more in the order of 12% per year. But for some reason, after five or six or seven years, if you haven't evolved into symptomatic WM, the risk of evolving into symptomatic WM declines. And so these patients are even followed more carefully than the IgM MGUS patients. And I would also add that probably the most common second opinion that I see in my practice is somebody who has asymptomatic or smoldering WM for whom therapy has been recommended when it's not indicated. And so that's the most common second opinion that I see for sure. I think it's because patients are going, going through the IWMF and reading about this and finding out that, hey, if I don't have symptoms, even though my IgM is high, it doesn't sound like I need to be treated. Now, how does smoldering disease or MGUS turn into symptomatic WM? Well, that's a very, very um, uh, interesting question scientifically. And a lot of doctors, including Dr. Irene Gobriel in Boston, are trying to figure this out. We know, for example, that if you have IgM MGUS and have the MYD88 mutation, we'll talk about this in a few seconds, that that increases your risk of going on to developing symptomatic WM. Now, Dr. Gobriel is conducting a study uh, called the PROMISE study, and I'm going to just include a one slide that talks about it. And the PROMISE study is looking at precursor conditions that turn into blood cancers. And, and myeloma is the much more common blood cancer that she's studying, but WM patients are encouraged uh, to uh, be part of this study. And I've included uh, a website here, and, and it's easy to Google. Just Google PROMISE study. WM and you'll be able to pull this up very readily and it's a way of sending in blood samples so that her laboratory can study this and try to figure out what makes a sleeping disease turn into a, a symptomatic disease. Let's talk about how WM patients show up in the doctor's office. What makes them go see the doctor? And sometimes they have signs or symptoms that make the doctor suspect it, but very commonly these days Patients with WM are, are discovered through routine blood testing. And what happens is they get their blood drawn for some other reason and their doctor finds that they're mildly anemic or that the total protein level in the blood is too high. And, I, and I've included an example here of when the total protein in the blood is too high. If you look here, the total protein in the serum is 9.0 and the range is 6 to 8.5. And so and what, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that um, there's too many proteins uh, in the blood and some of those proteins can, can be called globulins. And indeed here, if you look here, the globulin total in the blood is higher. 
So if a doctor sees that the globulins are elevated in the bloodstream, it might be a completely benign condition, for example, reacting to some type of infection, or it could be the sign of what's called a monoclonal gammopathy. And the monoclonal gammopathies can include WM, multiple myeloma, and other blood cancers. And so this is when the doctor would order that test called SPEP that I showed you uh, previously. So the history and physical exam are so important in WM. And I always tell my patients, and when I teach the students and the residents, I say, hey, when all else fails, listen to your patient. And in WM, your patient is going to tell you if they're symptomatic and need to be treated. And so the critical elements when you're seeing a patient with WM as a physician is to go through and do a careful history and physical examination. You wanna ask about the presence of headaches or blurred vision. Uh, you want to do a careful family history looking for other blood cancers in the family. You wanna look for people who have skin rashes or bruising or whose digits turn blue or purple in cold weather. That can be a sign of WM. You wanna ask about fevers or sweats. You wanna ask about peripheral neuropathy. Very important to do that. And if there's, any, uh, if there's an elevation in the IgM that's above, let's say 3000, then you need to think about having your patient see an ophthalmologist who is, knows what to look for in WM to look for signs of WM. And then lastly, there's this thing called amyloidosis that occasionally complicates WM that can produce shortness of breath or swelling and um, sometimes other complications. If you're seeing the doctor and your doctor suspects that you might have WM, what do they do? Well, they do blood work, they do a urine test, uh, and then of course we talked about the fact that a bone marrow biopsy is obligatory in this setting. And sometimes we do CAT scans or, or PET scans, although in contradistinction to other types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the scans are not as helpful in WM as they are in other lymphomas. But again, the most important thing by far, far, far and away is talk to your patient. Your patient will tell you uh, uh, what's going on. Again, to properly diagnose WM, just to pound this point in, a bone marrow biopsy is required and has to show this type of lymphoma called LPL, and you must find monoclonal IgM protein in the blood. Additionally, these days on the bone marrow biopsy, pretty much everyone is having mutational testing done on the bone marrow sample looking for a genetic mutation called MYD88 or MID88. And less commonly, there's a second mutation called CXCR4 that can be looked for in testing. And these are genetic mutations that aren't found in your normal cells. They're only found in the cells that have turned into the lymphoma, turned into LPL. So these are some optional tests here in Waldenstrom's uh, that, that we do based on what we learn from sometimes laboratory testing or mostly from talking to our patient. Uh, sometimes we see uh, something called Raynaud's disease or hyperviscosity. Uh, sometimes we have to do special coagulation tests if patients are having excessive bleeding um, or problems with nosebleeds, for example. And then if anybody has any unusual neurologic symptoms, we need to keep IgM neuropathy in the differential that is in our, in our minds and usually involve an experienced neurologist. And very rarely there's a complication of WM called Bing-Neal syndrome, B-I-N-G-N-E-E-L syndrome, which is when the WM cells actually get into the central nervous system and cause uh, very uh, debilitating sometimes neurologic symptoms. Now with respect to your blood tests, uh, there's a, a great pamphlet available through the IWMF and I would encourage you to uh, uh, take advantage of it because it really does a great job explaining all these blood tests that we regularly do and sometimes do. Let's talk a bit about hyperviscosity syndrome because everyone always wants to know if they have hyperviscosity. But viscosity is basically, it measures the flow of uh, the resistance of fluid when it's flowing. And water flows readily, it's less viscous, we call that thin. And oil, for example, uh, is, is flows less readily, it's more viscous, we call that thick. And these IgM proteins, remember they're these, it's a big protein with five antibodies all together. If you get a lot of that in your serum or in your blood, you can make the blood thick and, and it can flow like, like oil through your veins instead of like water through your veins. And that can cause a number of symptoms, including headaches, visual problems, or nosebleeds. And if someone has truly symptomatic hyperviscosity, then that's a medical emergency that needs to be dealt with. And usually what we do is we do a procedure called plasmapheresis, where we try to rapidly remove as much IgM from the blood as we can. And then of course, you have to address the underlying cause of the hyperviscosity that is to treat the WM effectively. The other point I like to make about hyperviscosity is that very often, you know, we have this test done, we have this viscosity that we measure in the blood on a routine test and the number can be high. And then you get this call from the laboratory or from the nurses saying your viscosity is high, but you talk to the patient and the patient has absolutely no signs or symptoms of hyperviscosity syndrome. 
So when I think about hyperviscosity syndrome, it's not just the number, it's what the patient tells me and what I find sometimes on physical examination. This is an example of a patient undergoing plasmapheresis. It involves either an IV placed in each of the arms or sometimes a large IV paste placed in the jugular vein of the neck and you're hooked up to a machine sitting in a lazy boy recliner for a few hours and your blood gets processed in the machine and as it's being processed in the machine the IgM protein can be removed and very often we'll do that two or three or four days in a row to correct hyperviscosity syndrome. bing neal syndrome, what is that? So it's when the lymphoma, uh, the LPL actually infiltrates and irritates the central nervous system. Fortunately this is rare, it can occur at any time point what I mean by that is patients can have their initial presentation with WM be that of bing neal syndrome where they have neurologic uh, pre presenting signs or it can show up in a patient who's had a diagnosis of WM for many years. So we need to be aware of it. Furthermore, the symptoms can be quite variable. Patients may have a speech problem or just weird numbness and tingling or weakness in an area. So it's, this is one of those things as a WM doctor we always need to be aware of when patients can have any neurologic complaints. The other scary thing about bing neal syndrome is it can occur even with the, when the WM does not appear to be worsening in the patient, meaning you can have a patient whose WM appears to be stable with respect to their IgM level and their symptoms, but they can still develop central nervous system complications sometimes from the, from the lymphoma. To diagnose bing neal syndrome, we start with MRIs that need to be done with contrast and then if we're suspicious about it, then we have to taste, draw a sample of spinal fluid and do special tests on it to test for the LPL cells and the WM. This is an example of an MRI here, and even I as, a, as an amateur neurologist can tell you that if you look here, the very bright white areas that you see on the scans here are the ones that are involved with the WM cells irritating the, uh, the surface of the brain, the little white and brighter areas. It's important to remember that WM is different in every individual. Your course is going to be unique to you. and You may read about patients who have a certain experience uh, on, through the IWMF or read about it in the torch. Somebody may have had treatment A or treatment B and done better or not done so well. And, and it's important to recognize the diversity in how WM patients present and how they're treated and respond to treatment, but your journey is gonna be unique to you, so keep that in mind. And there's great information for WM patients all throughout the IWMF and forums such as this one, but remember that one person's experience may not be yours. So what about prognosis? So I actually changed this slide over the past few years, and, and there was an old prognostics um, model, and what, what this means is that doctors, when they see a patient, patients want to know, doc, how am I gonna do? Am I going to be around for you know, graduations or grandkids or do I keep paying my mortgage? Do I keep getting my colonoscopies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? How long am I going to live? How am I going to do? And what we know in WM is that, that survival is long. We know that. And, and, but there are certain patients where we can see certain factors, certain features of their WM and say, you know, your disease might be a little bit more aggressive than somebody else. And so there are prognostic models that have been uh, promulgated to say, okay, how do we maybe counsel a patient that they have a WM that I might worry a little bit more about? And so these are different clinical prognostic models from a review by, by Dr. Dr. Advani last year. And, and basically, the one that's probably most in vogue right now is on the far left there. It's called the IPSS WM. And they have identified several factors that when they're taken together, said that you know your survival may not be as long as somebody else who doesn't have these factors with WM. What were those factors? Age above 65, which is most of you. Anemia, which is most of you. Low platelets, a high blood test called beta-2 microglobulin, or an IgM above seven. And if you had three, more than three of these adverse risk factors, then they predicted that your five-year overall survival was 36%. Now, this is a well-conducted scientific paper but I have to tell you that's just not my experience at all when I treat patients. That I think patients live a long time and I tell them to expect to live a long time with WM. And so when you read about prognosis, remember that that's, that's a, a way of a looking at a, a population of people with WM. When it comes down to you, just say, yeah, I'm gonna live a long time and, and let's go with that. This is a paper from Dr. Jorge Castillo. Uh, who's another speaker, of course, uh, at this forum. And, what, and this is an analysis done in 2014 and, pu uh, and published by him looking at 
survival. Remember these kaplan meier curves I showed you? And they looks at survival by your age and, be, and also having been diagnosed between 2001 and 2010. And what you need to remember if you're diagnosed between 2001 and 2010 and treated, that you were treated with treatments that aren't as good as the treatments that we have right now. And so this is, I would call this a worst case scenario, if you will. So if you're, let's say uh, in this dotted line here, between the age of uh, 60 and uh, 69, and, and everyone's diagnosed here uh, at time zero, and after 10 years, 75% uh, of people were still alive in, in, in this analysis. And we know it's even better now uh, than it was before. So I just tell people survival is long. Let's touch a little bit on treatment. And again, other docs are gonna cover the specifics of treatment, uh, but uh, what's the perspective, what's the overall, what's our approach to patients who need treatment for their WM? And so th this, these are my rules. So one is it's important to define the goals of treatment. Some patients uh, may have a goal of, doc, just don't make me sick no matter what. Another patient may say, doc, try to make this go away and, and never come back again if, you're, if that's even possible. I always ask, uh, when, I, when I see a patient, and I can make this judgment usually in a, within a couple of minutes of being in the room with them, is my patient young and vig vigorous or are they old and frail? And that will also play into your treatment choices. Additionally, am I interested in just making my patient feel better, that is fix their symptoms and maybe fix the anemia, or am I a believer, am I from the perspective that I think that the deepest best remission that you can obtain is the best thing for my patient. And those, those can produce very different treatment recommendations for patients. So do I just wanna make my patient feel better or do I wanna to try to make as much of this WM go away for as long as possible? Additionally, these days, we have to ask our patients if they're interested in fixed duration therapy, that is treatments given over many months or sometimes a couple years if we do this thing called maintenance, or are they interested in continuous therapy? Continuous therapy is treatment, usually oral, taken until side effects or worsening of the, di of the WM dictate otherwise. And this is a big deal. And patients that will have very disparate uh, opinions about what to do in this uh, situation. The next thing I, I ask is that, uh, are there certain long-term side effects from certain chemotherapy drugs that may impact my rec treatment recommendation to a patient? For example, there's a drug called bortezomib or Velcade that is a very effective WM treatment, but it may have as a side effect peripheral neuropathy that can linger uh, in patients often for a long time. There's also a very active drug in WM called bendamustine that carries risk of a small risk of bone marrow damage that at its worst could turn into acute leukemia. Again, not a common thing, but these things, these, these aspects often come into the, the, the uh, decision-making uh, as well. What about cost? Certain chemotherapy drugs uh, are quite expensive uh, depending on where you live and what the recommendations are and sometimes certain treatments are not very affordable for patients. We need to keep that in mind. And then does mutational status impact my treatment decision? That is looking for those genes MYD88 and CXCR4. Does it matter if what, you, what mutations you have with respect to the treatment recommendations that we make? And the answer is probably yeah, I think it makes a difference. Additionally, some patients with WM present with very aggressive symptoms. They'll present with sweats and fatigue and big lymph nodes are not feeling well. So rapid control of disease is very important in those patients, whereas other patients may just be on a very long road to increasing fatigue and eventually they get more anemic enough where we decide treatment's needed. And so you don't need as rapid control of, of disease uh, in that situation. And then we always ask ourselves if the patient has underlying neuropathy before treatment, because if a patient has neuropathy, we're certainly not going to use a drug or try not to use a drug that may cause neuropathy as a side effect. The WM working group uh, has come up with a consensus uh, panel for re recommending when to initiate treatment. And we'll go through these bullets together. The first is that a high IgM level by itself is not an indication to, init to initiate therapy. That is the IgM level. We don't look at that by itself to make a treatment decision. An exception might be if the IgM level gets above 6,000, very often those patients have hyperviscosity or may develop hyperviscosity soon. So some docs will treat at that level. If patients have hematocrits below 30 or platelet count below 100,000, that's considered an indication to initiate treatment. If patients have symptoms related to their WM, of course, we, we, would, want, we would want to treat those patients. If patients have symptomatic hyperviscosity, we, we need to treat those patients and somewhat urgently. If they have moderate to severe neuropathy, those patients are candidates for therapy. 
And if they have symptomatic cryoglobulinemia or cold agglutinin disease, those patients also should be treated. So we have reasons to treat WM based on lab tests and on symptoms. So what about lab tests? What, what patients with WM uh, do we treat based on a laboratory test? Well, if they have symptomatic cryoglobulinemia, uh, we treat that. If they have symptomatic cold agglutinin disease anemia, we treat that. If they have something called autoimmune anemia or thrombocytopenia, where the patient's immune system Pac-Mans or eats up the red cells in the platelets, we treat those patients. If we find uh, kidney irritation from the WM, we treat those patients. If they have this thing called amyloid, we treat those patients. Or if you're anemic or thrombocytopenic, we treat those patients. What about based on symptoms? Well, if you have recurrent fever, night sweats, or unintentional weight loss, or severe fatigue, then we treat those patients. And I will add that the most common reason for initiating treatment in WM is fatigue in my, in my practice uh, with, it, with or without anemia. Hyperviscosity would be a reason to treat based on symptoms, and symptoms again are um, nosebleeds, shortness of breath, confusion, uh, you know, visual disturbances. If patients have very large lymph glands or a big, big spleen or a uh, big liver from the WM, we treat those patients. And then if they have neuropathy that's moderate to severe, we treat those patients. So one key thing to remember is that the level of the IgM in the blood and the percentage of LPL cells in the bone marrow vary tremendously between patients. And some patients can have very low levels of IgM in their blood and be extremely symptomatic, while other patients can have very high levels of IgM in their blood and not have any symptoms at all. This is where it gets back to what I always say, talk to your patient, talk to your patient, your patient will tell you if they need to be treated. This is a slide I like to show at the educational forums, and don't worry, I'll walk you through it. What it looks at is it looks at the number of bone marrow cells that are, that are the number of lymphoma cells in the bone marrow, or the level of IgM in the blood, and what kind of problems it was causing. And in the top slide, you can see the IgM levels ranging between 2,000 and 14,000, and the level of bone marrow involvement. So, you can, so if you look in the far right, you can have patients with very packed bone marrows have very low levels of IgM. And conversely, uh, conversely you can have uh, patients who have seemingly minimal marrow involvement with high levels of IgM, so it's all over the map. Furthermore, with, with respect to anemia, that's, this is the hematocrit right here, you can have patients with very packed bone marrows and only minimal anemia, or hardly any lymphoma in their bone marrow, and a lot of anemia. So there's more than just your IgM level or how much uh, lymphoma is in your marrow that goes into uh, whether or not we decide you need treatment and what treatment. So what about mutations? Well, we need to learn about these mutations in 2020. They're here to stay. And so we're talking about what are called genetic mutations. These are changes in the DNA inside the nucleus of these lymphoma cells that are acquired. That is, you were not born with them. So mutations that you're born with and can pass on, they're called, um, they're different types of mutations. They're germline mutations as opposed to somatic mutations. So these are somatic mutations. They occurred after you were born over the course of your, li of your life by bad luck. And the two big mutations in WM are the mid-88 mutation and the CXCR4 mutation. And we're learning, the more we learn about these mutations, the more we learn that the, the presence of them can influence how your WM actually behaves and how it might respond to certain treatments. And so the first mutation is called MYD88, and it's present in just about every single person who has WM, 95% depending on how hard you look for it. And it's always the same mutation, this thing called L265P. The second mutation called CXCR4 occurs less frequently, perhaps in 40% of WM patients, and there are many different kinds of CXCR4 mutations. And these different kinds of CXCR4 mutations can behave differently in patients. And so we're beginning to take WM and to split it into different kinds of WM based on these mutations. I should also say that the MYD88 muta uh, mutation testing is done pretty much everywhere on bone marrow biopsies these days, whereas the CXCR4 mutation testing is a little more technically challenging to do and not all doc doctors order it or believe that the results they get when they do order it. So that, that'll get better over the years, but that's the situation with those. So this discovery of the MYD88 mutation by Dr. Treon and others, and this is a seminal paper, and this is from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, that, that this, this was huge because prior to us finding the MYD88 mutation 
in, in Waldenstrom's. Uh, there was even some debate about whether or not Waldenstrom's was this, was this real separate disease and separate lymphoma. And so I always tell my patients, it's like when Pinocchio found out he was a real boy. Well, this is when Waldenstrom's became a real disease by itself, was when we discovered this genetic mutation. And like in other cancers, whenever we find a genetic mutation that's involved in the majority of, of, of certain cancers, invariably that leads to improved treatment for those patients. Now, this is the CXCR4 mutation list. Uh, you're going to be all tested on this immediately after this webinar today to go through all these different mutations that are present in CXCR4 mutations. Needless to say, there are several of them and there are different kinds of them and it can be pretty tricky sometimes to identify these mutations. So let's do another slide on what I call Oncospeak. And this is language you need to, with which you need to be familiar to be proficient in WM. And the first ones, when we talk about treatments, is response rate. And response rate is the percent of patients who have at least a 50% reduction in measurable Waldenstrom's. And then PFS, doctors love to talk about PFS, which means progression-free survival. And that means how long patients went before relapsing or dying. Doctors always present, they'll say, this treatment produced a PFS, a median PFS of 60 months. What does that mean? It means that when patients got this treatment, by 60 months, half of them had relapsed or died, but half of them had not relapsed or died. That's what PFS means. Overall survival is just what it says. And then the mutational lingo are, the, are, are these last four bullets. One is wild type, and you'll see this language a lot in WM literature. And wild type means an unmutated gene. And we refer, when we refer to MYD88 or CXCR4, we, talk, we speak about being mutated or unmutated. If it's not mutated, then you have wild type. If it's mutated and you're a CXCR4, we sometimes call that WIM. And if you're mutated uh, MYD88, we call that sometimes L265P. And furthermore, in CXCR4, we can have mutations that are of the frame shift kind or the nonsense kind. So you're not expected to understand all these, but just be aware that this is the language that we use when we're speaking about mutations in WM. Now, how do we use MYD88 and CXCR4 to help distinguish between different diseases? Now, many years ago, I would see a patient in my practice and I would look at them and they had an IgM in their blood and they had this lymphoma in their bone marrow. And I said, boy, do they have Waldenstrom's or do they have something called marginal zone lymphoma? And it, it could be impossible sometimes to distinguish those. So the MYD88 testing helps us, but it's not perfect. If you look here at the uh, untreated WM patients, you find that 95% of them in, this, in the highlighted box in the middle have the MYD88 mutation. In marginal zone lymphoma, it's 10%, meaning it's, it's, it's sometimes present, but not very often present. So if I have a patient who's got a slow growing lymphoma, they have an IgM, they have an MYD88, I'm pretty much gonna bank on a Waldenstrom's, especially if I find a CXCR4, which we hardly ever find in marginal zone lymphoma. Now, the major reason for doing this MYD88 testing in the blood cancers that have an IgM is that there's a type of multiple myeloma, which is a very, very different cancer. Multiple myeloma is, is, is nastier, that has an IgM. And I've seen patients diagnosed with Waldenstrom's who have IgM myeloma and treated inappropriately because of that. So the MYD88 test can help us very, very much in distinguishing IgM myeloma from Waldenstrom's because in IgM myeloma, we do not find an MYD88 mutation. The other thing we know is that depending on if you have the CXCR4 mutation or not, the behavior of your Waldenstrom's can differ. So meaning that if you have a mutated CXCR4, you can have higher levels of lymphoma in your bone marrow, higher levels of IgM in your blood, more acquired von Willebrand's disease, which is a blood clotting disorder, uh, like a cousin to hemophilia and so forth. So we can make distinctions between different types of Waldenstrom's based on the CXCR4 testing. This is another slide that shows that. So in our world, we talk about what are called genotypic and phenotypic associations in WM. And genotypic is what the DNA shows inside the cell. Phenotypic is what the patient looks like in real life. And so we can take a patient here who has MYD88 mutation, but no CXCR4 mutation. And that's the majority of patients, 60%. And what we know is that their IgM levels are moderately high. They have a fair amount of marrow involvement and they respond really well to a type of treatment called BTK inhib 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 inhibition. 
for an in contradistinction, if you have MYD88 mutation and a nonsense CXCR4 mutation, you have very high levels of IgM in your blood, very, very high levels of infiltration of the lymphoma in your marrow. You don't respond nearly as well to the BTK inhibitors. Unfortunately, this is less common. So we talked a little bit a few minutes ago about this thing called transformation. And transformation is when a slow-growing lymphoma morphs or changes, changes into, into a very aggressive lymphoma. And this is not good when this happens. This is a serious event when this happens. And one thing we know is that if you, if you have WM and you do not have the MYD88 mutation, and we're sure of that, if you don't, if you don't have it, and that's only 5% or fewer of patients, your risk of transformation is higher. And so this is where information about your MYD88 mutational status can sometimes be very helpful. And this slide basically shows that if you look on the left here, in the blue we have the mutated MYD88 patients. In the dotted red line we have the patients who don't carry an MYD88 mutation. And this is over years, uh, the risk of transformation. So if you look here, after 15 years, the risk of transformation on this plot would be predicted to be about 25% for those who don't have the mutation and very, very low for those who do have the mutation. So again, if you are a WM patient and you don't have the MYD88 mutation, the big thing is to make sure that these, these patients do not have IgM myeloma. That's the most important thing. And again, the myeloma patients often have chromosome 14 mutations, bone lesions on, on, on imaging studies, and no CXCR4 mutations. So in Greece, they have a tremendous Waldenstrom's research group led by Dr. Demopoulos and Dr. Kistritis, and they reviewed in one of our journals called Blood, isn't that a great journal name for the American Society of Hematology, Blood. And so in Blood, they reviewed last December uh, how to treat and what's the general approach to somebody who has WM. And this is a approach to uh, um, uh, managing them. So we diagnose WM, we're sure of it, we do the biopsy, we find the IgM, we do the appropriate genetic studies. And then we assess our patients to see if they need therapy. Are they symptomatic or are they smoldering? And if they're asymptomatic, we follow them very carefully. If they're symptomatic, then we need to discuss on the left-hand side here, is there a need for immediate disease control or not? Uh, what are their comorbidities? Do they have heart failure or diabetes or hypertension? Uh, or are they healthy and young and vigorous? And also, what's the patient's preference? We talked about that before. Is their pre preference to be treated more aggressively, less aggressively? Fixed duration therapy of a few months? Continuous therapy for a much longer period of time? And then we pick a therapy based on that for our patient. I want to touch a little bit about the risk of infection in WM patients. And we do know that WM patients even those who haven't been on chemotherapy, and sometimes even those who are smoldering, are at an increased risk for infection. They're immunocompromised. And a large Swedish study published in 2014 suggested that WM patients carry about a three times increased risk of infection. And this is a slide showing that. These are the patients who, have, uh, who don't have WM. These are control patients in Sweden. And for WM patients here, these are cumulative serious infections over a period of 20 years. And it also might significantly be important having an increased risk for viral infections. Viral infections. And of course, all of us, when we hear viral infections these days, we think of COVID-19. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And one thing that's really cool, and many, many of you may have already heard this, is that one of the BTK inhibitors that we use, a brutinib, might protect patients against some of the lung complications in COVID-19 infected patients. And Dr. Treon and others made these observations in the spring of this year and published this in our journal Blood. And now there are studies that are ongoing testing these various BTK inhibitors to see if they're effective for preventing severe pulmonary injury and pulmonary disease in COVID-19 infected patients. I think that's pretty cool. So what, what to do with COVID-19 if you're a Waldenstrom's patient? Well, Dr. Dessau, who's in, in the UK, just did for the WMUK group, and it's also available through the IWMF, a, a very, very, very nice review of, of, of COVID-19 and how it affects WM patients. I, I have included the link here. I refer you to it. It's far too much to cover in this, in this talk today. Also, the IWMF is collecting data with what's called the whimsical study, for uh, COVID-19 and its impact on WM patients as well. The website is included here as well. And, and it's actually pretty easy to find. If I found it on the IWMF, IWMF website, you can find it too.
So the thing is right now, if you're a WM patient, there are no uniform recommendations for what to do. And I say, speak with your team about what to do. What are the restrictions for your activities, for travel? Should you be on treatment? Should you be deferring treatment when you have WM? Talk, talk to your doctor about this because there's quite variability in the recommendations that we make depending on many, many, many factors. And certainly do not stop your treatment without speaking with your team. Do not stop your treatment without speaking to your team about whether or not that's the right thing to do. And again, we think that the BTK inhibitors and their names are abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib may have a role in the COVID-19 fight. So what do I tell my patients in my practice? Well, what I tell them is, is use, do the common sense stuff. So social distancing is really, really, really important. The most common question I think I get from my patients these days when we, when we talk about COVID-19 is can I hug my grandchildren? Again, a lot of WM patients are older. They have grandkids. And initially, when the COVID-19 pandemic was really hot in March and April of this year, I, I was telling my patients to be super, super, super cautious and probably not. Now it's become apparent though that COVID-19 isn't going anywhere anytime soon. We're going to be dealing with this for all of this year, probably a lot of next year. And so you can't go all that time and not hug your grandkids. It's not good for you, it's not good for them. So what I say is if, the, if their parents have not been reckless and the kids have not been reckless and they have no symptoms and you feel pretty good about it, give them a hug. It's good for everybody. Those hugs can be really therapeutic for everybody. The other thing I tell my patients is frequent hand washing. I cannot emphasize this too much. Frequent hand washing is so, so, so important. Wash them well and wash them frequently. And also wear a mask. Just to give you an example. So in our clinic, we had an individual in our clinic uh, actually get COVID-19. And what we'd, we, had, we had adopted from the get-go hand washing, masking, and distancing no one else got infected, no, no staff, no patients, no one else got infected in the clinic because we we're following the rules of hand washing, masking, and distancing. That's what you have to do. And so when you, if you're in a situation where you're not, you, don't, you haven't vetted everyone who's around you, that's a mask situation. Now, I, people come in, a, in the office sometimes, I see masks worn in every which way possible. So when I was trying to figure out a way to educate people how to wear their mask properly. The New York Times had this great cartoon here and there are six different ways of wearing a mask, only one of which is correct. And so we'll go through those really quick here. The first one, the upper left is you, you don't cover your nose. Next one is you don't cover your chin. The third one is it's too loose. Uh, it's, you can breathe in anything you want around it. The other one here, it only covers half of the face. This guy's got it down around his chin. That doesn't work. So you want a tight fitting mask around the nose, around the chin, fitting snugly around the cheek. That's how you wear your mask. And so get a mask, wear them, and that's gonna be really, really, really important. There are several studies already that have come out that have shown the importance of mask wearing to limit transmission of COVID-19. And at that point, I'm gonna stop this presentation. It was really, it's always interesting talking to uh, camera and not talking to the patients. It's much, much, much better to talk to the patients. You can see who's falling asleep in room in row five. Uh, you can do all, you can, you know, you can get bad looks from someone. You can have Carl Harrington tell me I'm, I'm running over time in the front row. So it's a little bit of a challenge to do it on the web. I hope it was okay. I hope it was helpful. And we're actually going to have time for live questions right after this. So thank you very much. That was a great talk, Dr. Mattis. We really appreciate you presenting such clear and very helpful information today. My name is Mary Brown. My husband, Don, was diagnosed with WM in 2002, and we lead the IWMF Chicago Area Support Group. Dr. Mattis is going to answer as many of the questions from the audience that we have time for today. Here's the first question. It has a few parts. Are WM patients more susceptible to getting COVID-19? Would it be a more serious event for WM patients? And are the COVID-19 antibody tests reliable for WM patients? Mary, those are really common questions that we're getting in the clinic on a regular basis. And so the answer is yes, our WM patients are more susceptible to getting COVID-19. WM patients often have 
lower levels of our own immune infection fighting proteins called IgA and IgG. WM patients are on treatment, uh, particularly with some treatments that can lower those antibody levels even more. Um, then WM can be more serious. We all heard earlier this year about patients with blood cancers having uh, more serious uh, COVID-19 infections. York area back in the spring when things were pretty. So yes, yes, we are more susceptible. We do, we do need to be more careful. And how about the antibody test? So the antibody tests look for infection which already occurred. That's what the antibody tests do. There are several antibody tests out there and they're variably reliable. So they're as reliable in our WM patients as they are in patients who do not have WM, but we have not so far been advocating antibody testing for our WM patients or for anybody else looking for infection in most situations. I'm not sure we're ready for prime time with that yet, uh, but uh, they certainly can be reliable. And for those of you who have had COVID-19 infection, Remember that in a lot of patients now, we're collecting serum, um, that is the antibodies from the patients who, had, who have had previous exposure to COVID-19, but we don't do that in patients who have blood cancers and who had COVID-19. So I'm not routinely recommending antibody testing yet until I have a little more faith in the actual test. Slide okay. Here. The next question, and you hit on this a little bit during your talk, what is the current life span of a patient diagnosed with WM, the average? Again, it's a, it's a pretty common question, and, and what I tell my patients is we can guesstimate it based on some of those prognostic factors that we look at, but I usually tell my patients it's measured in decades, uh, the average lifespan, and I truly believe that. It's hard in our practice to recall patients who have died because of WM. Uh, there are a few I can think about over the years, but not very many. So, Mary, I tell my patients, survival is long, long time. That's, that's a great answer. <laughs> and my husband's had it 18 years, so that's always good. Uh, Best the next question. That there can be. Yeah. Okay. How next can question. one choose the right initial treatment protocol? Is there a guideline all patients should follow? Another really good question, and the answer is, how does one choose the right initial protocol? First, the, the most important thing is make sure that treatment is required. Make sure that we're not treating someone who does not need to be treated, who is smoldering. That's, that's really, really important. Next thing is, there's no single guideline for all patients. We have, to, we have to take our different treatments and adapt it to the individual's needs and wants. And so, again, it, it comes down to what's the urgency for treatment? Is there a need to rapidly treat the WM or do we have time to make it better? Are patients interested in oral treatments with the BTK inhibitors that can be taken for a long, long period of time? Or do they want to be treated with the more aggressive traditional chemotherapies that can be done in a few months and then hopefully have a long period of time without needing to be treated with anything? All this um, has to be adapted to the individual patient. So this is where being a second opinion is a really good idea a lot of ways to, to treat this disease. Okay, next question. next question. What's the best option at time of relapse? Go with what worked the first time or a BTK inhibitor? Sure, so the, again, another really good question, Mary. And, and what I do is you, you, you make the exact same assessment, relapse, govern your treatment recommendation that you made when your patient was initially diagnosed. You look at the exact same factors. Do they need to be treated? Do they have other health conditions that come into play? For example, if, if they have peripheral neuropathy, we're probably not going to recommend a drug that could cause peripheral neuropathy, such as bortezomib. If, they, if they've never had a BTK inhibitor, a BTK inhibitor can be a great choice. We want to make sure that they have the MYD88 mutation, ideally, uh, based on a, on a bone marrow test. I treated people uh, the second time around with what we, were, what we used the first time around. Absolutely we have, particularly if the first treatment uh, resulted in a remission that lasted a long period of time without, without any significant side effects. You can go back to the well very often and do it again. Aim though the same treatment exercise, decision-making exercise for relapse disease, go through for initial disease. 
Another thing I want to add, Mary, is it's, it's always really, really good to ask your doctor if there's a clinical trial available. A lot of times in our field, the most innovative or exciting treatments are those that are available on clinical trials. So always a good question to ask about clinical trials. Okay, great. Um, how successful is a brutinib if you don't have MYD88 or CXCR4 markers? Or would other BTK inhibitors be better? All the BTK inhibitors, abrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, and only right now abrutinib is FDA approved in, in our country. Um, they, uh, they, they all work the same. So one doesn't work if the other doesn't work. So abrutinib really requires to work the MYD88 mutation. And again, about 95% of WM patients carry the MYD88 mutation. If you don't have the MYD88 mutation and you're pretty confident in the lab result, then abrutinib really should be taken off the table as a treatment option. The CR4 mutation with the MYD88 mutation in 40% of WM patients, and if you have the CXCR4 mutation, abrutinib still works really well, just not quite as well, and it sometimes takes longer to work. And so it can still work, uh, but it just doesn't work as well as in, in those patients who do not carry the mutation. Okay. Next question. Is there any way to tell whether our children are at higher risk of developing WM and or other blood cancers? No standard way to determine this, uh, Mary. And, and again, it's important here to keep in mind the concepts of absolute risk and relative risk of getting WM. Let's just say that a patient has WM, they want to know about their children's risk of getting WM. And the patient, this is a three in a million cancer. Let's just say that in family members it goes up three or five times, it goes from three in a million to nine or ten or fifteen in a million. Still pretty darn rare, and we do not routinely test those patients to see if they have WM. What I tell my patients is tell your children if they go to the doctor, just make sure that they know that someone in their family had WM. There's no specific testing that, that is done, but sometimes there are little clues in blood work that can say, hmm, I wonder if something's going on with this patient. Now, I would encourage people that are interested in this to participate in studies the likes of which Dr. McMaster's or Dr. Gobriel are doing, trying to understand uh, various predispositions. Oh, okay, thank you. Are there any newer, more effective treatments on the horizon for peripheral neuropathy? I wish is the honest answer to that one. Um, the, the ways that we attack peripheral neuropathy, and these peripheral neuropathies are extremely challenging, WM and WM, about treating the underlying cause. It is treating the WM with effective treatment. I hope that that helps. And most of the other treatments are symptomatic in nature. And we go through stepwise things that we try that are over the counter, and then we go to prescription medication if need be to treat the WM, but treating WM is neuropathy and IgM neuropathy is very challenging. I, I tell patients a lot of what I do in this disease is trial and error, and I do a lot of mixing and matching of over-the-counter things and prescription things, but are there newer treatments or more effective treatments? The answer is sadly not, uh, not of which I am aware. Okay, maybe in the future. Next no. question. Um, is fatigue a symptom of WM? If so, what can be done about it? Fatigue might be the most common reason that we start treatment for a patient with So it's very common. Fatigue is, is absolutely a symptom of WM, and so ways to deal with that are to treat and fix the WM. That's one, and improve anemia. If there's anemia, make that go away. But there's some things that patients can do very, very effectively, and, and one of those is exercise. Exercise has been shown again and again and again, not just in WM, but in other cancers and blood cancers, to be maybe the most effective treatment for fatigue. Other things are get rest when you need it, avoid sedating things, good sleep habits, and there are other things that we can do, but I would say treat the WM and exercise are probably the top two.
my husband would consider tennis his uh, treatment for WM, so <laughs> it helps him a lot. Absolutely. Next question. Also, Mary, attitude's a big deal. Attitude is a big deal. Is itchiness a symptom of WM? Also, is itchiness a side effect of rituximab, including dry, itchy eyes? All of the non-Hodgkin lymphomas can have itchiness. The medical word is pruritus for that as a symptom of lymphoma. It's not really common in WM. I don't hear that very often, but it can be WM. It can also be other medications, of course. Rituximab can cause itchiness but usually only when you're getting the drug administered in the office. I don't think about rituximab causing persistent itchiness over days or weeks or months. Okay. Question, Mary. Next question. Besides the many obvious everyday things, what else can a caregiver do to help a friend with WM? Another great question. I would say educate, 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 and the IWMF is the absolute best way to educate about the disease and what to look for. Encourage the patient to um, be positive, to exercise and so forth. And then I think that if, I think patients can still access this, but back in January through the IWMF, we had a, a webinar that dealt with the, care, the caregiver's role for WM. And in that webinar, which was, I, I thought, pretty good. Most of the speakers were pretty good. Um, I was on there, so I'm not going to say all of them. But the, uh, that would be a great place to get other ideas. And I would, uh, I'm pretty sure it's available through the IWMF website. Okay, that is a good website. Um, then we have our last question. Is there a preferred treatment protocol for someone who is 80 and over and active? The answer is no. There's not a preferred treatment protocol. And, and, and so when I look at a patient, I make a distinction in my mind between older and frail and young and vigorous. I make that determination based on the physiologic presentation of the patient, not the chronologic. What does that mean? You can have someone who's 80 who's skiing 50 days a year and hiking in the mountains. You may have someone who's 60 who has a hard time getting out of bed or, or moving. And so you're going to treat those patients differently. So I don't look at age so much, to be honest with you. So for I have the exact same discussion with an 80-year-old. Do, do you want to take a brute nib and a pill and get on that for a long period of time? Or do you prefer to have uh, chemotherapy and, and be done with it in a few months? have learned, and Dr. Castillo from Boston has uh, mainly done this work, is that I think that we can actually <laughs> lower some of the doses of the standard chemotherapy drugs we use in older patients and have it be as effective without so much, uh, without so much risk for side effects. So in my mind, everything is still on the table. Okay. Well, we... So appreciate you being with us. We thank you so much for your participation and for answering all these questions. The IWMF is extremely grateful to all of you in the audience for being with us, and we hope you enjoyed today's educational webinar. We do understand that some of you had technical difficulties in the beginning, and we apologize for that. This presentation will be available in the future. You can watch for an email or check the IWMF website. Also, please remember to register for the two-day 2020 IWMF virtual ed forum scheduled for August 27th and 28th. There will be a lot of really helpful information going on those two days. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us.